Hello and welcome to HIVRNA Test Guide Podcast, your trusted source for HIV testing, with over 4,500 plus testing labs across the United States. Welcome back to the deep dive. You know, the last few years have really shown us how quickly science can move, haven't they? Absolutely. I mean, look at COVID-19, obviously a terrible time, but out of it came this huge world-changing leap forward, mRNA vaccine technology getting, well, widespread approval. Genuine breakthrough moment. So we took the sources you sent us, and today we're diving into how that same tech is now aimed at maybe the toughest virus we've faced, HIV. We really want to unpack for you why the old ways failed for so long and, you know, how mRNA seems to solve a core problem. It's a fascinating shift. The success with COVID, I mean, estimates suggest it saved, what, 1.4 to maybe 4 million lives? No. That didn't just tackle one crisis. It proved this whole new way of uh, making and delivering vaccines. Mm. It really opened the door for diseases where the usual methods, like protein-based ones, just weren't working. Mm. And yeah, HIV has always been right at the top of that difficult list. Okay, so let's get into that. This biological brick wall we fit for like 40 years. Okay. Why is HIV so much harder than other viruses? What are the, um, the fundamental issues? Well, the difficulty really comes down to a couple of main things, biologically speaking. First, it's just the sheer genetic diversity. Meaning lots of different versions. Exactly. HIV isn't just one single virus. It's uh, like a swarm of slightly different versions, different subtypes, and they're all infectious. So making a vaccine for just one, pretty pointless because <laughs> others will just get through. Okay, so challenge one, variety. What's the second big problem? The second is how it dodges our immune system. Once it's inside you, the virus mutates incredibly fast. Right. So any immune response we teach the body, it has to be super adaptable, really broad. It can't just look for one specific coat protein. It needs to recognize this sort of uh, fundamental essence of the virus, no matter how it tries to disguise itself. So if it keeps changing its disguise, what are we actually aiming for? What's the stable target on the virus? The only real target, the bit it uses to get into our cells, is this protein structure called the N-thrimer protein. It sits on the outside, on the envelope. Okay. And that's the only place these neutralizing antibodies can grab hold to stop it. We hear this term a lot, broadly neutralizing antibodies, or BNABs. Can you break that down for us, maybe an analogy? Sure. So the vaccine's job is basically to show a template to certain immune cells, these naive B cells. They're like um, blank slates ready to learn antibody production. Right. But the specific B cells that can make these broadly neutralizing antibodies, the ones that can hit that end primer, no matter the subtype, they're incredibly rare in our bodies. Think of it like uh, searching a whole city for one specific type of master key. Wow. Okay. Very rare. Very rare. Yeah. So the vaccine has to be extremely accurate. It needs to find that rare B cell and activate it perfectly. If the template is even slightly off, or if it points the B cell to the wrong part of the target. The whole thing fails. The whole defense can fail, yeah. Because you basically wasted that rear B cell on a bad blueprint. That really puts the failure of the older vaccines into perspective. If the target's that tricky, why did the traditional protein-based ones, you know, injecting bits of the protein, struggle so much? Well, it was kind of a double whammy. First, there were issues just making the protein. Often yeah. they'd grow the envo protein in bacteria and then pull it out. Okay. But that process could change the protein slightly, modify it. So the template you injected wasn't quite a perfect match for the real thing on the virus. Right. So strike one is an imperfect copy, but you said double whammy. What was the other maybe bigger issue? The sources mentioned a kind of structural problem, a binding trap. Ah, yes. This is really the core of why those failed. And honestly, it's quite clever on the virus's part. On a real HIV particle, that ENVO protein has, let's say, two important bits. Okay. There's the exposed part, the bit we want antibodies to hit. But then crucially, there's a base section, an unmodified bit, that's usually tucked inside the virus shell, hidden away. Hidden, okay. So, so when you just inject the manufactured ENVO protein on its own, that normally hidden base part is suddenly wide open, totally exposed. Oh. For the B cells, which often go for the easiest target, binding to that exposed, unmodified base is, well, really easy. It's like a big flashing decoy sign. So the immune system makes antibodies perfectly fine, but they're trained to attack a part of the protein that's actually hidden when the real virus shows up, like having the right key, but for a lock that's always covered. That's exactly it. The antibodies that match that easy to reach base, they can't actually bind to a real HIV particle during an infection because that base is tucked away inside. Wow. You've trained your defenses to go after a ghost. 
the traditional injection methods just couldn't easily get around that fundamental structural trick. Okay, that makes the shift to mRNA potentially revolutionary then. How does putting in the genetic code instead of the protein itself get around that really clever trap? The magic is in where the protein gets made and shown to the immune system. Mm -hmm. mRNA vaccines give your own cells the instructions. Right. So your cells produce the NV protein in situ right there in its sort of natural context. And when our cells make it, they don't just float it around freely like in an injection, do they? Exactly. That's the key difference. When the protein is expressed on the surface of your body's cells, which the mRNA tells them to do, the whole setup changes. How so? Crucially, that problematic easy binding site, the hidden base of the NV protein, is now physically blocked by the cell membrane itself. It's shielded hidden from the immune cells patrolling around. Ah, I see. So the decoy is hidden by our own cells. Precisely. By hiding the wrong binding site, the immune system is effectively forced to focus only on the parts that are exposed the correct, vulnerable tips of the NF trimer. So it guides the immune system to make the right antibodies. It basically prompts the B cells to train on the actual attack surface. It's like um, structural guidance forcing them down the right path. That really is an aha moment. It's not just what you make, but how and where you present it. And the sources mentioned they were incredibly careful about testing this. Oh, absolutely meticulous. Before human trials, they tested, I think it was five different mRNA formulations for each vaccine candidate. Five. Yeah. And they weren't just counting antibodies. They were specifically measuring the ratio how many good, broadly neutralizing antibodies that hit the right spot versus those useless ones that hit the hidden base. They needed proof this structural idea actually worked in practice. And did it. What's the early human data showing us? We've got some really, really promising initial results from the main phase one trial. It's called HV302. Started in 2022, about 108 people, and it's a long haul plan to run until 2027, plus more monitoring after that. Okay, so early days, but what's the headline finding from HV302? The standout finding is this stark difference depending on how the protein was presented. They tested two main versions, one where the mRNA made the protein stick to the cell surface membrane bound. Right, the one where the base is hidden. Exactly. And another version where the protein was made to be soluble, sort of floating free, not stuck to the membrane. Okay, and the results? Just striking. For the membrane bound version, 80% of the participants generated the desired immune response, no matter what dose they got, yeah. 80%. 80. Okay, and the other one, the free-floating one? Only 4%. 4%, yeah. wow. 80 versus 4. That's, that's not just a difference. That feels like proof of concept for the whole structural argument. It really validates the core idea, doesn't it? Presenting it on the membrane, hiding that decoy base, forces the immune system to learn the right lesson. It mimics how the protein looks on an actual infected cell. Makes total sense. And we should also note there's another trial, IAVI G002, started back in 2021 with two vaccines. But we're still waiting on results from that one. Okay, so the science looks incredibly promising on the structural front. But, you know, there's always the safety aspect. What hurdles are popping up in these trials? Yeah, safety is paramount, always. The main thing flagged in the sources is a specific side effect, hives, urticaria. Hives, okay. How common? It was reported in about 6.5% of participants in two of the three vaccine groups being tested. And the concern is that for some, these weren't just brief reactions. They lasted quite a while, well after the trial dosing. That sounds problematic. It is. It's something they absolutely have to figure out how to manage or mitigate before thinking about wider use. It shows that even with a brilliant mechanism, perfecting the delivery and minimizing side effects is still crucial. It's easy to get lost in the science, the mRNA details, but we have to remember the context here. This is a fight that's been going on for, what, 40 years now? Absolutely. It's vital to keep that perspective. 40 years since HIV was first recognized as a disease. And in all that time, globally, only seven people have ever been confirmed cured. Seven. Just seven. That's sobering. It is. And the sources point out progress here is slower than we saw with COVID. That's partly biology, as we've discussed, but it's also sociological factors. Right now, there are still 15 million people around the world living with HIV who don't have access to the basic antiretroviral therapy, RT. 15 million without treatment. Wow. So the biological challenge is huge, but the access and distribution challenges are equally massive. It really highlights that even with breakthroughs like potential vaccines, there's so much more to it. I mean, we have made huge strides in prevention, like pre-EP and treatments that allow long, healthy lives. Definitely. Long-term preventative options, rapid treatments after exposure, 
the management has improved immensely. So the fight continues on many fronts. It's not just about finding that one vaccine. No, it's truly holistic. You need the scientists pushing the boundaries in the lab, like with this mRNA work, but you also absolutely need the activists, the governments, the community health workers focused on getting existing treatments and prevention tools to everyone who needs them. The science might be turning a corner, but the broader societal effort has to keep pace. So if we boil down this whole deep dive, the right. real game changer, the central aha from your sources seems to be about structure, about location. The genius isn't just that mRNA works fast, it's where it tells the body to make the protein. Exactly, it's about controlling the manufacturing environment, using our own cells, using the cell membrane as a natural shield yeah. to hide that misleading part of the NV protein. It forces the immune system, guides it, to train properly on the real targets, avoiding the trap that basically sunk the earlier vaccine attempts. It's like a clever structural workaround. A really elegant biological solution. But connecting that amazing science back to the bigger picture, it leaves us with a really important question for you, the listener, to think about. Mm -hmm. We've heard the sources mention both the complex biology and the sociological reasons for slow progress. We know 15 million people still lack basic RT. So as this advanced science races ahead, potentially towards a vaccine, what responsibility does that scientific progress carry for tackling those huge global access issues now, even before a vaccine is fully ready? That's the critical question, isn't it? How do we ensure that scientific advancement and global equity move forward hand in hand? That effort really needs to be baked in from the start. A powerful thought indeed. Thank you for joining us on this deep dive into what could be the future of the HIV fight. We'll catch you on the next one.